Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, the first webinar of the Smart Chart webinar series focused on XPS. My name is Rena Samsu, Marketing at EAG Laboratories, a Eurofins company. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items for today's event. All attendees have been muted. However, we'd still love to hear from you during today's presentation. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenter by typing your questions into the questions panel located in the bottom right of your screen. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. At the end of the webinar, a survey will pop up on your screen. Your feedback is greatly appreciated and will help us to improve our future events. I would now like to introduce Monica Neuberger, Manager of Surface Science at EAG Laboratories. Thank you, Rena. You said I'm Monica Neuberger, a manager of the Surface Science Group at EAG's lab in Sunnyvale, California. Over the last 15 years, my career has been focused on surface chemical analysis and materials characterization. My particular areas of expertise are XPS and time of flight sims. I'll begin this webinar with a brief introduction to EAG and then we'll discuss the smart chart itself. I'll go over the fundamentals of XPS and the methods of its operation. I'll show a number of examples of XPS, including surface analysis, angle resolved analysis, and depth profiles. I'll wrap up by summarizing both the strengths and limitations of XPS as an analysis technique. EAG has several hundred highly educated employees working in laboratories around the world. We offer XPS in five locations, including California, Minnesota, New Jersey, and the Netherlands. Our range of equipment and diversity of expertise allows us to provide our clients with a comprehensive peer-reviewed report within a few days of sample receipt. When necessary, we can even provide same-day service. Now, before delving into the smart chart, I do want to give a very brief review of precision and accuracy. Of course, nobody wants an analysis technique that has low precision and low accuracy with these scattershot measurements that come nowhere close to the true value. Low precision with high accuracy is also not ideal since it takes a large number of measurements uh, to come up with an average that can be relied upon as accurate. A number of techniques fall into this category of being not entirely accurate, but very precise. XPS falls into this category, and this is actually a decent analysis place to uh, live in since a comparative measurement will accurately show the difference between samples. So you'll get a good measurement of the difference between a good and a bad sample or an old process and a new process. Uh, the ideal, of course, is to be both accurate and precise, but that is very seldom achievable. So this is our EAG smart chart. This chart is a spectroscopy and microscopy and now analysis resolution tool. Each of the bubbles represents a different analysis technique. The surface analysis, analysis techniques are located inside the box. On the vertical axis, we have detection range from trace level species up to matrix level species. On the horizontal axis, we have analysis spot size. So some techniques can measure very small features in the nanometer range, while other techniques analyze larger areas in the centimeter range. Outside the box on the right, we have our bulk techniques. So these have a range of detection limits uh, for composition, but they do not give uh, location or layer type information. 
below the box, we have our imaging techniques. So these can measure features over a range of sizes. Some go very, very small, but they do not inherently provide compositional information. The last feature of this chart is color. Each of the bubbles is color coded to indicate the type of information that technique provides. Looking inside this box for surface analysis, blue bubbles indicate techniques that provide elemental information. Red bubbles, such as XPS, give chemical bonding information or oxidation state. XPS can detect and quantify all elements except for hydrogen and helium, and it provides chemical state information. This makes it a very powerful survey analysis technique. Now this figure shows the approximate depth of analysis of the various techniques. As you can see here, the idea of surface analysis has a somewhat different meaning depending on the technique being used. XPS analyzes the top five to 10 nanometers of the sample surface. Thus, it will likely detect a thin organic layer of material that might be undetectable by a technique such as FTIR, which probes a larger volume. There are many uh, key applications of XPS. It can characterize stains and discolorations. It can give the composition of powders and residues and evaluate cleaning processes. XPS can also determine the oxidation state and oxide thickness of alloys. This is commonly used for electropolished stainless steels. XPS can analyze carbon functionality, both of polymers and low-key dielectrics, and is a good tool for general surface functionalization. It can be used in a depth profile mode to analyze thin films for matrix level constituents and composition. So now let me describe what the photoelectric effect is, the XPS process. So we have here our sample, uh, which is irradiated with X-rays. Those X-rays penetrate several microns deep and force electrons from the sample to be ejected. Only electrons from the top 100 angstroms or less have enough energy to escape the surface and reach the detector. Here we have the same process, but now we're looking at it on an atomic scale. So here's our sample atom. The X-ray comes in and forces the emission of a photoelectron. That process leaves behind an excited ion, which will relax according to a couple of different processes. One process will emit a fluorescent X-ray and another process will emit an OJ electron. All three of these processes will happen at the same time, no matter what the instrument is called. With the, within the XPS tool, we have an electron detector so we detect the photoelectrons and the OJ electrons, and the two are very easily distinguished from each other. Now we have a schematic of the XPS spectrometer. We use an electron gun uh, to hit an aluminum anode, so we're generating aluminum K-alpha X-rays. Those X-rays are monochromated before they hit the sample. The ejected electrons are collected in a lens, sorted with a hemispherical energy analyzer before they reach the detector. All of this takes place in an ultra-high vacuum chamber. So it's important to note that any sample uh, needs to be vacuum compatible. So we measure the kinetic energy of the photoelectrons because it's that energy that tells us what element uh, the electron came from. But the data are plotted on a binding energy scale. So the binding energy 
is equal to the energy of the incident X-ray minus the measured kinetic energy. These last two terms of the spectrometer work function and net surface charge are very, very small and are constant for each instrument. So plotting the data on a binding energy scale gives greater consistency in the data when different X-ray sources are used. We have a number of modes of XPS analysis. Most analyses will begin with a survey. This looks at the full energy range with very, very high sensitivity. From this, we can identify and quantify all elements present on a surface. And there are times when this is all a person might need. If you need to know whether or not sulfur is present on your sample, the survey alone should tell you. Other times, um, a high resolution analysis is needed to determine chemical bonding state. So the high resolution analysis uses a narrow scan with a very high energy resolution. And from that, we can determine uh, the chemical bonding state from the peak position and peak shape. So while a survey might tell you if sulfur is present, the high resolution analysis can tell you if you have a sulfide or a sulfate. Both surveys and high resolution analysis uh, can also be combined with ion sputtering to produce a depth profile. So here is some typical XPS data. This is a survey spectrum for a silicon carbide nanopowder. We see there's quite a bit of oxygen and carbon. There are two signals coming from silicon because we're seeing electrons from the silicon 2p orbital and the silicon 2s orbital. There are also low levels of chlorine and nitrogen in the sample. And we've been able to quantify the composition of the nanopowder from this survey. Now this survey on its own does not tell us that silicon was found as a carbide. For that, we need to look at the high resolution scan for the silicon signal. In analyzing the areas underneath these two curves, we see that roughly two thirds of the total silicon was found as a carbide and roughly one third of the total silicon was found as an oxide. We can see also that this high resolution scan is not at all the same as focusing on the survey tighter. The survey simply does not have the same resolution. We know that this lower binding energy signal is a carbide and the higher one an oxide, as opposed to any other bonding forms of silicon that might exist, because a great number of reference compounds have been analyzed uh, by many different sources over the last <laughs> several decades. And these uh, binding energies have all been tabulated, and there are a number of publicly available sources for this information. So we can see here that silicon as a carbide is going to appear over at a much lower binding energy than a silicon oxide. Most elements have a number of bonding forms that can be easily distinguished like this. Many elements also have other bonding forms that are not so easily distinguished. Sticking with silicon as an example, we can see that this organic compound of silicone appears at the same binding energy as an inorganic silicate salt. These two compounds cannot be distinguished by XPS without the addition of other information from the sample. There are another, a number of examples I will show you today. We'll start with a comparison of clean room gloves. I'll also show an adhesion investigation, looking at a haze on a wafer. I'll show an example of small spot XPS analysis. We'll look at how oxide thickness can be measured non-destructively. I have an example of looking at the depth of a surface treatment. Again, this is a non-destructive depth measurement. Um, 
and I have a few def that excuse me, a few depth profiling examples. Here we have clean room gloves. There's been a lot of talk about gloves lately, and a clean room glove, that clean room designation simply means that it doesn't have a lot of particles on it, but these gloves can still be heavily contaminated. We analyzed uh, five different types of gloves often used in clean rooms. I'm showing two here as an example. We can see that glove number three has a large amount of silicon, which we later found to be a silicone. That might have been used as a mold release agent. This one, glove number four, has a significant amount of zinc and also high levels of chlorine. So we know that some manufacturers dip their gloves into a chlorinated solution to make the glove more slippery, and then it doesn't need a powdered lubricant. Also, sometimes zinc compounds are used in the manufacture of natural uh, rubber or latex. And here we have the composition of all five gloves that we analyzed. We see that gloves three and five both have high levels of silicone, and gloves two and four both have high levels of zinc, also the chlorine. So these contaminants uh, can be transferred from the glove to an item being handled as evidence or uh, used for other XPS experiments. It's important to note uh, sample history and handling. XPS is commonly used to investigate adhesion problems. In this case, we're looking at uh, polyethylene coated paperboard cartons. These are very similar to milk cartons. These cartons are formed by coating the paperboard with polyethylene, and that polyethylene is corona treated before uh, two layers are bonded together with glue. We were asked to help solve a problem once in which uh, some bad cartons had the glue delaminating from a, the polyethylene. In a good carton, the paperboard would tear long before the glue bond would break. Now, silicone is a ubiquitous contaminant. It's um, often found in oils and greases, and it is often responsible for adhesion problems. So that's always a suspect. Another possibility was that the polyethylene here may not have been properly corona treated. So here we see the XPS survey spectrum from a good carton in red and the bad one in blue. If silicon had been present, any silicone, we would have noticed the silicon signal at about 100 electron volts, but we found none. So silicone was ruled out as the cause of this problem. We also noted that the good carton had higher levels of oxygen than the bad one. When we looked at the high resolution spectra for both the carbon and oxygen, we saw no significant differences in the carbon chemistry between the good and bad sample, but still this good sample had noticeably higher levels of oxygen than the bad one. From here, we analyzed more control samples. We looked at a control for a corona-treated sample and a non-corona-treated sample. We see the corona-treated sample had the highest levels of oxygen total, whereas the non-corona treated sample looked very much like the bad carton. Thus, the bad carton had not been properly corona treated. Now, there are many uh, reasons why a silicon wafer might become discolored in some way. In this case, we were you know, asked to solve that problem we have survey spectra here from a reference spectrum, a reference area on the top, a nice clean area of the silicon wafer. And we see it's mostly oxygen, some silicon, a little bit of carbon, nitrogen, tin, and fluorine. But the discolored or cloudy area had 
uh, very significant levels of fluorine. And also down here in this low binding energy range, we're not seeing silicon, rather it's aluminum. So we looked more closely at the aluminum high resolution signal and found that it was mostly aluminum fluoride with also a, a low level of aluminum metal. So here we can see that haze was predominantly aluminum fluoride. So most XPS analyses analyze areas many hundreds of microns in size. But we can focus down the X-ray beam to small areas. In this case, we used a beam focused down to a 20 micron diameter. This is very useful for analyzing small particles, uh, defects, or other features. To locate such a feature or particle, the X-ray induced secondary electron image, or SXI image, can be very valuable. This is somewhat similar to an SEM image, but it has much, much poorer lateral resolution. Now this 20 micron X-ray beam is not a perfect square wave. That beam does have tails, so the total area analyzed will be larger than that 20 microns, probably something closer to 60 microns in diameter. Still, we can see from this 100 micron bar here, a 60 micron diameter area would have analyzed or did analyze this particle quite nicely without any of the data coming from the surrounding PET. So we have a survey spectrum here from the particle compared to the reference area of the PET. We see the PET is mostly carbon and oxygen while the particle has a great deal of fluorine, a little bit of silicon. And we can even see a difference in the carbon chemistry just from the survey. In the particle, it looks almost like a doublet. When we look closer at the high resolution scan of that carbon, we see that PET, as we know, is mostly hydrocarbon with low levels of carbon oxygen functionalities, whereas the particle is primarily fluorocarbon with some hydrocarbon also. Now the hydrocarbon portion here should not be at all surprising because everything that has been exposed to air will have some amount of hydrocarbon and oxygen contamination just from the air exposure. So while we can see the particle is definitely has a fluorocarbon component, we're not entirely certain if the hydrocarbon is inherent to the particle or if it is from that air exposure. XPS does have some ability to non-destructively measure oxide and oxynitride thicknesses in some systems. This is based by comparing the intensity of a substrate peak with the surface oxide. Remember that XPS has an information depth of approximately 50 to 100 angstroms. We need to be able to detect that substrate in order to perform this measurement. So this only works for oxides thinner than the total information depth. So what we're doing here, comparing these two intensities, we've also combined this uh, with parameters derived from standard samples, cross-reference against other techniques, and we've developed a, a thickness measurement. So we can see in these two traces here with the elemental peak normalized, we have a very clear difference in the areas underneath these oxide peaks. But look closely at this measurement. That difference is about one angstrom. Well, there are a couple of different ways to get depth information from XPS. We can do this non-destructively with angle resolved analysis. That can uh, limit the sampling depth to be only the very near surface region 
or we can completely maximize that surface, that sampling volume. We can also uh, get a destructive depth profile with energetic ion beam sputtering. The rates of that sputtering can vary uh, depending on the thickness of the film or the total depth of the profile desired. So let me describe angle resolved XPS analysis. This involves tilting the sample with respect to the X-ray source and analyzer. This angle determines the total sampling depth according to this equation here. This lambda parameter is the mean free path of electrons within the sample. This lambda value will vary from one element to another, but it will be constant within a single system. So when we have a very large angle from the sample surface to the analyzer, we have maximized the volume of the measurement. But when we have a very small angle from the surface to the analyzer, we now have a very shallow sampling depth. So let's see this put into action. Now we're looking at a plasma-treated polystyrene sample. At the top, we have this very high takeoff angle, the maximum sampling depth, and we see a particular carbon-oxygen ratio. With a very small takeoff angle, the measurement is now limited to only the very near surface region, and we see a completely different carbon-to-oxygen carbon ratio. This gets even more interesting when we look at the carbon chemistry in the high resolution scan. With the big takeoff angle, maximizing sampling depth, we see that polystyrene is primarily a hydrocarbon. And there are very low levels of carbon oxygen functionalities observed. But with the small takeoff angle, looking only at the very near surface region, we now see that the carbon oxygen functionalities are taking up a much larger portion of the overall carbon signal. So this is showing that the plasma treatment uh, primarily affected the near surface region. The plasma treatment did not affect the bulk of the sample. I do have a, I would like to describe ion beam uh, sputter depth profiling. This is done with an energetic ion beam. We can choose the energy of the beam to vary the sputter rate. Data acquisition cycles are alternated with sputtering cycles. We can use both high resolution element windows or this could be done in a survey mode. We can also rotate the sample to enhance depth resolution. That is particularly useful for multi-layer films. There are some issues with ion beam sputtering. That sputtering process can change the chemistry of some samples. Also, organic information can be lost. Some sputter beams tend to obliterate organic molecules into a bunch of carbon atoms. Also, some systems suffer from preferential sputtering. In that case, the observed composition would be different from the initial composition. In a case such as that, a technique such as Rutherford backscattering is, uh, could be quite good. It gives a very accurate measurement of stoichiometry. So here's a cartoon um, just illustrating that um, alternation between sputter cycles and analysis. The ion milling is used only to remove material. And the analysis is performed at the bottom of the sputter crater. So we have these repeat measurements after every sputter cycle, ultimately building up the depth profile. There are several types of ion beams to choose from. There are monatomic beams, such as argon ions, which are very suitable for a variety of inorganic materials. These are good for profiling metals, ceramics, and glasses. These beams also 
tend to damage organic materials. We also have gas cluster ion beams, such as C60, or large clusters of argon atoms. These beams tend to provide the dual benefit of increased sputter efficiency and decreased molecular degradation. As such, these beams are ideally suited to profile soft materials such as polymers and certain metal oxides. So here's an example of a monatomic ion beam profile. This is an argon ion profile of an anti-reflective coating on glass. We see a constant uh, trace of oxygen at the top. Silicon is shown in blue and titanium in red. So we can see that the anti-reflective coating in this case was composed of alternating layers of silicon dioxide and titanium dioxide. This calcium is a marker for the glass substrate. Now I said something a couple of slides ago that might seem contradictory. I said that we can use high resolution windows to monitor changes in surface chemistry with depth. And I also said that the sputtering process can change the chemistry of the sample. Now that second statement is true for some compounds, but not all. Here we see an example of a haze on a silicon wafer and the survey spectra from the as received surface look nearly identical. So at the surface, there's no noticeable difference between the normal area of the wafer and the hazy white area. So then we did a pro depth profile. Now these montage plots show the individual scans from each uh, layer of the depth profile. This is the scan after every single sputter cycle. At the back, we have the as received surface. And moving forward, we have, we're going deeper into the film. So in this normal region at the bottom, we see the native oxide on the surface and silicon quickly becomes the elemental silicon of the substrate. Now in the hazy or white area, again, we have the native oxide at the back, and then we found a buried oxide layer. So this was the cause of that discoloration. Even though the surfaces look the same, there was that buried oxide in the hazy area. So within our EAG network, we're fortunate to have a number of sputter guns available. We do have the monatomic argon ion, we have the argon clusters, and also C60. So here's an example of the C60 sputter beam being used to analyze a polymer layer, PLGA, on steel. Within this depth profile, we can see constant traces for carbon and oxygen within the film. And then we see iron, chromium, and nickel in the substrate. But really, the more interesting portion of the slide is here on the right hand spectrum, the high resolution scans of carbon from the different layers within the profile. We can see the hydrocarbon and carbon oxygen functionalities of that PLGA. And we can see that those are maintained through, at different depths all throughout that profile. We only see carbon become a carbide down in the substrate. So we've shown that XPS can provide, the, um, can identify and quantify all elements except for hydrogen and helium. It is a quantitative analysis and it can provide a chemical state or oxidation state information of the elements observed. It can also analyze insulating samples. 
the detection limits for XPS are typically about 500 parts per million or 0.1 atomic percent. The analysis areas can be as large as many hundreds of microns or up to a, about two millimeters, and it can go down to uh, 10 or more microns. The organic information can be somewhat limited. I showed a number of examples where we could distinguish different uh, carbon-oxygen bonding forms from hydrocarbon or fluorocarbon from hydrocarbon, but I did not discuss nitrogen-containing organic species. Carbon-nitrogen bonding forms tend to appear at the same binding energies as carbon-oxygen bonding forms. So when we have both oxygen and nitrogen containing organic species in the same sample, those can be difficult to impossible to distinguish from each other. I'd also like to remind you that XPS is an ultra high vacuum technique. So samples do need to be vacuum compatible. Now within EAG, we do have a host of techniques uh, that can complement the limitations of any one measurement. Auger and time of flight SIMs are often good complements to XPS analysis. As we can see back on the SMART chart, Auger can analyze much smaller areas than XPS. Time of flight SIMs too can analyze smaller areas than XPS, but it actually provides much, much better organic characterization. It also has much lower detection limits.